Jamaica Inn by Daphne du Maurier. It was a chill grey day in late November. The air was clammy cold, and for all the tightly closed windows it penetrated the interior of the coach, and the few passengers huddled together for warmth. Mary Yellen sat in one corner with her chin cupped in her hands, her eyes fixed on the window splashed with mud and rain. The rather gallant courage which was so large a part of her, and had stood her in such stead during the long agony of her mother's illness and death, was now shaken by the rain and nagging wind. It was a gentle rain that fell at Helford, her home for the past twenty-three years. This was a lashing, pitiless rain that stung the windows of the coach, and it soaked into a hard and barren soil. Folk were friendly in Helston. The name of Yellen was known and respected in the town, for her mother had had a hard fight against life when her husband died, and she had flogged her energy for the seventeen years of her widowhood. She could not stand up to the strain when the last test came, and a sickness attacked the ground and killed the livestock in the villages round Helford. When the old mare who had served them twenty years died in her stall one morning, Mary's mother had a stroke. For six long months Mary nursed her, but it was not the widow's will to recover. It was as though she longed for release and prayed silently that it would come quickly. She said to Mary, I don't want you to struggle as I have done. It's best for you to go to your aunt Patience up to Bodmin. You'll like her. She was always a great one for games and laughing. You remember when she came here twelve years back? Yes, Mary remembered Aunt Patience, with her curled fringe and large blue eyes, and how she laughed and chatted. She was as pretty as a fairy. What sort of a man your Uncle Joshua is, I cannot say, said her mother, for I've never set eyes on him nor known anyone that has. Promise me, child, that when I'm gone you'll write to your aunt and tell her that it was my last and dearest wish that you should go to her. I promise, said Mary. When the mists came in the morning and the frosts settled on the ground, the widow died. One by one Mary saw the things she had loved pass into other hands. She packed her small belongings in her father's trunk and once more read the letter from her aunt. The writer said she was shocked at the blow that had befallen her niece that she had no idea her sister was ill. She went on, There have been changes with us. I no longer live in Bodmin, but nearly twelve miles outside on the road to Launceston. It's a wild and lonely spot. Your uncle does not object to your coming if you are quiet-spoken and not a talker, and will give help when needed. He cannot give you money or feed you for nothing, and will expect your help in the bar in return for your board and lodging. You see, your uncle is the landlord of Jamaica Inn. It was a cold, empty letter giving no word of comfort. The smiling Aunt Patience, with her silk petticoat and delicate ways, the wife of an innkeeper? This was something her mother had not known. However, Mary had promised, and there was no returning on her word. And so it was that Mary Yellen found herself northward bound from Helston in the creaking, swaying coach through Truro town and on to Bodmin, grey and forbidding like the hills that cradled it. One by one the passengers departed, all save Mary, who sat still in her corner. The driver, his face a stream of rain, looked in at the window. Are you going on to Launceston? he said. It'll be a wild drive tonight across the moors. I'm not afraid of the drive, said Mary, and I don't want to go as far as Launceston. Will you please put me down at Jamaica Inn? The man looked at her curiously. Jamaica Inn? he said. What would you be doing at Jamaica Inn? That's no place for a girl. Oh, I've heard it's lonely enough, said Mary, but it's quiet on Helford River where I come from, and I never felt lonely there. I shall be all right. I'm going to relatives. My uncle is landlord of Jamaica Inn. There was a long silence. In the grey light of the coach, Mary could see the driver was staring at her. She felt chilled suddenly, anxious. 
She leaned forward and touched his arm. Is my uncle not liked? Is something the matter? The man looked very uncomfortable. He spoke gruffly and avoided her eyes. Jamaica's got a bad name, he said. Queer tales get about. Respectable folk don't go to Jamaica anymore. That's all I know. Why don't folk go there? What is their reason? Mary persisted. The man hesitated. They're afraid, he said at last, and would say no more. We best be going then. You're the only traveler on the road tonight. The coach rumbled away down the street, past the safe and solid houses, the busy winking lights, the scattered people hurrying home for supper. Soon the lights of Bodmin disappeared and Mary was alone with the wind and the rain and twelve long miles of barren moor between her and her destination. On either side of the road the country stretched interminably into space. No trees, no lanes, no cluster of cottages or hamlet, but mile upon mile of bleak moorland, dark and untraversed. No human being could live in this wasted country, thought Mary, and remain like other people. The very children would be born twisted, like the blackened shrubs of broom, bent by the force of a wind that never ceased. Their minds would be twisted too, their thoughts evil, dwelling as they must amidst marshland and granite, harsh heather and crumbling stone. She lost count of time and space till she heard the driver urging his horses to greater speed. She lifted the sash and looked out. She was met with a blast of wind and rain that blinded her for the moment. And then she saw that the coach was topping the breast of a hill at a furious gallop. Ahead of her, on the crest and to the left, was some sort of a building standing back from the road. She could see tall chimneys, murky dim in the darkness. There was no other house, no other cottage. If this was Jamaica, it stood alone in glory, four square to the winds. Mary gathered her cloak around her and fastened the clasp. The horses had been pulled to a standstill. The driver climbed down from his seat, pulling her box down with him. He seemed hurried and he kept glancing over his shoulder towards the house. Here you are, he said, across the yard there yonder. If you hammer on the door, they'll let you in. I must be getting on or I'll not reach Launceston tonight. In a moment, he was up on his seat again, shouting at his horses and whipping them in a fever of anxiety. The coach disappeared as though it had never been. Mary stood alone with the trunk at her feet. She heard bolts being drawn in the dark house behind her, and the door was flung open. A great figure strode into the yard, swinging a lantern from side to side. Who is it? came the shout. What do you want here? Mary stepped forward and peered up into the man's face. Suddenly he laughed and took hold of her arm, pulling her roughly inside the porch. <laughs> it's you, is it? He said. So you've come to us after all. I'm your uncle, Joss Merlin, and I bid you welcome to Jamaica Inn. He drew her into the house and shut the door, and they looked upon each other face to face. He was a great husk of a man, nearly seven feet high, with a creased black brow and a skin the color of a gypsy. His thick, dark hair fell over his eyes in a fringe and hung about his ears. His features had once been good. His nose was hooked, curving to a mouth that might have been perfect once, but was now sunken and fallen. And there was still something fine about his dark eyes, in spite of the pouches and the red blood flecks. So you are Mary Yellen, he said, towering above her. And you've come all this way to look after your Uncle Joss. I call it very handsome of you. Where is my Aunt Patience? Mary asked, glancing around her in the dimly lit passage, cheerless with its cold stone flags and narrow, rickety staircase. Is she not expecting me, then? He lifted his head to the stairs. Patience, he roared. Here's the girl, arrived. 
There was a little flutter at the head of the stairs, the flicker of a candle, and an exclamation. Down the narrow stairs came a woman, shielding the light from her eyes. She wore a dingy mob cap on her thin grey hair, which hung in elf locks to her shoulders. Her face had fallen away, and the skin was stretched tight across her cheekbones. Her eyes were large and staring, as though they asked perpetually a question. And she had a little nervous trick of working her mouth, now pursing the lips and now relaxing them. She wore a faded striped petticoat that had once been cherry-coloured and was now a washed-out pink. And over her shoulders was flung a much-mended shawl. Mary stared at her dumbly, stricken with sorrow. Was this poor, tattered creature the bewitching Aunt Patience of her dreams, dressed now like a slattern and twenty years her age? Dear Aunt Patience, she said gently, I'm glad to see you again. It's so many years since you came to us at Helford. The woman clung to her, burying her head against her shoulder, and she began to cry loudly and fearfully. Oh, stop that, growled her husband. What sort of a welcome is this? He shouldered Mary's box as though it weighed less than a paper packet. I'll take this to her room, he said. And if you've not got a bite of supper on the table by the time I'm down again, I'll give you something to cry about. Aunt Patience controlled herself. You mustn't mind your Uncle Joss. She said, her manner changing suddenly, fawning almost like a whimpering dog that has been trained by constant cruelty to implicit obedience. Your uncle must be humoured, you know. He has his ways, and strangers don't understand him at first. She pattered on mechanically, going backwards and forwards across the flagged kitchen. You'll soon come to like your uncle Joss, and fit into his ways, continued her aunt. He has a great name hereabouts, and is much respected. Mary murmured some reply. There was a footfall outside the door, and her uncle came into the room. So the hens are clacking already, he said. He pulled a chair from the wall and crashed it against the table. He sat down heavily, and reaching for the loaf, cut himself off a great hunk of bread, which he slabbed with dripping. He crammed it into his mouth, the grease running down his chin, and beckoned Mary to the table. You need food. I can see that, he said. And he proceeded to cut carefully a thin slice from the loaf, which he quartered in pieces and buttered for her. The whole business very delicately done. There was something almost horrifying in the change from rough brutality to fastidious care and the exquisite movement of his long, powerful fingers. She thanked him quietly and began to eat. Patience, my dear, he said. Here is the key. Go and fetch me a bottle of brandy for the Lord's sake. I've a thirst on me that all the waters of Dos Mary would not slake. In a few minutes, his wife returned with the brandy, and he fell to drinking, staring moodily before him. Suddenly, he thumped the table with his fist. I'm master in this house, Mary Yellen, he shouted. You'll do as you're told and help in the house and serve my customers. And by God, if you open your mouth and squawk, I'll break you until you eat out of my hand the same as your aunt. Mary faced him across the table. She held her hands in her lap so that he would not see them tremble. I understand you, she said. I'm not curious by nature, and I've never gossiped in my life. It doesn't matter to me what you do in the inn or what company you keep. I'll do my work about the house, and you'll have no cause to grumble. But if you hurt my aunt Patience in any way, I'll find the magistrate and bring him here and have the law on you. Very prettily put, indeed, he said. All right, my dear, you and I are more akin than I thought. 
I may have work for you at Jamaica one day. Work that you've never done before. Man's work, Mary Yellen, where you play with life and death. Mary heard her Aunt Patience give a little gasp beside her. Oh, Joss, she whispered. Oh, Joss, please. There was such urgency in her voice that Mary stared at her in surprise. The agony in her eyes frightened Mary more than anything that had happened that night. What had roused Aunt Patience to such panic? What had Joss Merlin been about to say? Get up to bed, Patience, he said. This girl and I understand one another. The woman rose at once and went to the door. Her uncle pushed the empty brandy glass away from him and folded his arms on the table. There's been one weakness in my life, and I'll tell you what it is, he said. It's drink. It's a curse, and I know it. I can't stop myself. One day it'll be the end of me because I talk then until every damn thing I've ever done is spilt to the four winds. I've told you because I'm already a little drunk and I can't hold my tongue, but I'm not drunk enough to tell you why I'm the landlord of Jamaica Inn. I heard your aunt telling you we kept fine company here. It's lies, all lies. I'll tell you that much for you'll come to know it anyway. The coaches don't stop here, nor the mails neither. I don't worry. I've got customers enough. The wider berth the gentry give to me, the better pleased I am. Oh, there's drinking here, all right, and plenty of it, too. There are nights when the only lights for miles are the blazing windows of Jamaica Inn. They say the shouting and the singing can be heard as far down as the farms below Rustor. You'll be in the bar those nights, and you'll see what company I keep. Mary sat very still, gripping the sides of her chair. She dared not move for fear of that swift changing of his mood, which she had observed already. They're all afraid of me, who's afraid of no man. There's never been a Merlin yet that died peaceful in his bed. My father was hanged at Exeter. I'm the eldest of three brothers, all of us born under the shadow of Kilmar, away yonder above twelve men's moor. My brother Matthew, he was drowned in Cuartha Marsh. My brother Jem, damn him, was the baby. I never did see eye to eye with Jem. Too smart he is, too sharp with his tongue. He fell silent gazing at his empty glass. I've said enough, he said finally. Go up to bed, Mary. Here's your candle. You'll find your room over the porch. Mary took the candlestick without speaking and was about to pass him when he seized hold of her shoulder and twisted her round. There'll be nights sometimes when you hear wheels on the road and those wheels will not pass on, but they'll stop outside Jamaica Inn. And you'll hear footsteps in the yard and voices beneath your window. When that happens, you'll stay in your bed, Mary Yellen, and cover your head with the blankets. Do you understand? Yes, Uncle. She went out of the room and into the dark passage, her uncle had told her the room over the porch, and she crept across the dark landing and found a door. And turning the handle, she saw by the flickering flame of her candle that this was her room, for her trunk lay on the floor. The walls were rough and unpapered, and the floorboards bare. A box turned upside down served as a dressing table, with a cracked looking glass on top. There was no jug or basin. She supposed she would wash in the kitchen. The bed creaked when she leant upon it, and the two thin blankets felt damp to her hand. She went to the window and looked out. Then she pulled down the blind and crept to her bed. Her teeth were chattering and her feet and hands were numb. For a long while she sat huddled on her bed, a prey to despair. 
Mary woke to a high wind from the west and a thin, watery sun. Looking out of the window and across the yard, she saw that the stable door was open and there were fresh hoof marks in the mud outside. With a great sense of relief, she realized that the landlord must have gone from home. Hurriedly, she unpacked her trunk and in ten minutes she was down in the kitchen and washing in the scullery at the back. Aunt Patience's manner was normal enough this morning, and she was obviously making an effort to be cheerful. Mary decided it was only in the presence of her husband that she went to pieces like a frightened child. During the morning there was the usual work of the house, and Mary was thus able to explore the inn more thoroughly. It was a dark, rambling place with long passages and unexpected rooms. There was a separate entrance to the bar at the side of the house. The rooms appeared neglected or unused. Even the parlour had a solitary air, and the guest rooms upstairs were in an even worse state of repair. Down a passage that ran parallel to the one above was another room, the door of which was locked. Mary went out into the yard to look at it through the window, but there was a board nailed up against the frame, and she could not see inside. The house and outbuildings formed three sides of the little square that was the yard. Beyond this lay the road, a thin, white ribbon that stretched on either hand to the horizon, surrounded on each side by the black hills and the moors. The grey slate inn, with its tall buildings, forbidding and uninhabited though it seemed, was the only dwelling place on the landscape. She went back into the house to find Aunt Patience her appetite sharp for the dinner that she hoped awaited her. She fell to with a will upon stewed mutton and turnips, and, her hunger appeased now for the first time for four and twenty hours, she felt her courage return to her, and she was ready to question her aunt and risk the consequences. Aunt Patience, she began, why is my uncle the landlord of Jamaica Inn? Why? Her aunt faltered. It's a very prominent place here on the road. There's always company on the road. Yes, Aunt Patience, but why don't they stop at Jamaica? Why is the parlour never used, and why are the guest rooms stored with lumber? I've seen them for myself. We have custom, returned her aunt sullenly. There are evenings when the bar is full of men come in from the farms and outlying places. The driver on the coach yesterday told me respectable people did not come to Jamaica anymore. He said they were afraid. Aunt Patience was pale now, and her eyes roved from side to side. She swallowed and ran her tongue over her lips. Your Uncle Joss has a strong temper, she said. You have seen that for yourself. He is easily roused. He will not have folk interfering with him. Aunt Patience, why should anyone interfere with a landlord of an inn who goes about his rightful business? Her aunt was silent. Mary tried another question. Why did you come here in the first place? My mother believed you to be in Bodmin. It's near his old home, said her aunt. Your uncle was born only a few miles away, over on Twelve Men's Moor. His brother, Jem, lives there now, in a bit of a cottage, when he's not roaming the country. Mary ventured one more question. Aunt Patience, what has the barred room at the end of the passage to do with the wheels that stop outside Jamaica Inn by night? A strange expression crept upon the woman's face, and her great hollow eyes stared across the table in terror. Her mouth trembled, and her hand wandered to her throat. She looked fearful, haunted. Mary, she said, and her voice was hushed and low, scarcely above a whisper. Mary, there's things that happen at Jamaica that I've never dared to breathe evil thing. Your Uncle Joss mixes with strange men 
who follow a strange trade. Sometimes they come by night and your Uncle Joss lets them in and he takes them along that passage to the room with the locked door. When they come, Mary, you will say nothing to me or to your Uncle Joss. If you come to guess but half of what I know, your hair would go grey, Mary, as mine has done. And that lovely, careless youth of yours would die. Joss Merlin was away from home for nearly a week. And during that time, Mary came to know something of the country. Her presence was not required in the bar, for no one came to it when the landlord was from home. And after giving her aunt a hand with the housework and in the kitchen, she was free to wander where she pleased. Patience Merlin was no walker, so Mary would strike off on her own at midday with nothing but the sun to guide her and a certain deep-grained common sense which was her natural inheritance as a countrywoman. The moors were even wilder than she had at first supposed. On the high tours, the slabs of stone leant against one another in strange shapes and forms, and when the wind blew on the hills, it whistled mournfully in the crevices of granite. One day she crossed the East Moor and saw that the land descended into a deep and treacherous marsh, and rising beyond it was a crag like a split hand coming sheer out of the moor, its surface moulded in granite as though sculptured, its slope a venomous grey. So this was Kilmar Tor, and somewhere amongst that solid mass of stone where the ridges hid the sun, Joss Merlin had been born, and his brother lived today. Below her in the marsh, Matthew Merlin had been drowned. Mary turned her back upon Kilmar and began to run across the moor. She had come farther than she intended, and it seemed an eternity before she saw the tall chimneys of Jamaica Inn. As she crossed the yard, she noticed that Joss Merlin had returned. She opened the door as silently as possible, but it rubbed against the stone flags and grated in protest. The sound rang in the quiet passage, and in a minute the landlord appeared from the back. He was, it seemed, in high good humour, for he shouted boisterously at Mary. Well, he roared, aren't you pleased to see me? Mary made an effort to smile and turned to go up the stairs to her room when Joss called her. Here, no skulking up there this evening. There'll be work for you in the bar. Don't you know what day of the week it is? Mary paused to think. Was it Monday's coat she had taken? That made today Saturday. Tonight there would be company at Jamaica Inn. They came singly, the people of the moors, crossing the yard swiftly and silently, as though they had no wish to be seen. Some carried lanterns. One or two rode into the yard on ponies. Others were yet more furtive, bearing neither flare nor lantern but flitting across the yard with hats pulled low and coats muffled to the chin. The reason for stealth was not apparent, for any passing traveller upon the road could see that tonight Jamaica Inn gave hospitality. The light streamed from the windows and the sound of voices rose upon the air. Securely separated by the counter and half screened by a barrier of bottles and glasses, Mary could look down upon the company and remain unobserved. They were dirty for the most part, ragged, ill-kept with matted hair and broken nails. Tramps, vagrants, poachers, thieves, cattle stealers and gypsies. Luckily she did not have to move amongst them. Her duty was to do what washing and cleaning of glasses was required. After the first curious stare, the shrug of the shoulder and the chuckle, the company gathered in the inn ignored her. Her aunt did not appear, though Mary was aware of her shadow behind the door at times. Those who remained sufficiently sober to stand had crowded round a peddler who had a string of loathsome songs, and with these jewels he now provided entertainment to the company. Mary touched her uncle on the shoulder. I can't stand this, she said. I'm going upstairs to my room. 
she was surprised to see that although he had been drinking during the evening, he was sober and knew what he was doing. Had enough of it, have you? He said. Think yourself a little bit too good for such as we. Get out, then. It's close on midnight anyway, and I don't want you. You'll lock your door tonight, Mary, and pull down your blind. Mary ran out of the room, undressed hurriedly and crept into bed, pulling the blanket over her head, stuffing her fingers in her ears. At length, she slept. And then, without warning, she heard something snap in the peace of mind that had enfolded her, and she was awake suddenly sitting up in bed, with the moonlight streaming on her face. She listened, hearing nothing at first, but in a few minutes there came another sound, from beneath her room this time, the sound of heavy things being dragged along the stone flags in the passage downstairs, bumping against the walls. She got out of bed and went to the window, pulling aside an inch of blind. Five wagons were drawn up in the yard outside, Three were covered, each drawn by a pair of horses, and the remaining two were open farm carts. One of the covered wagons stood directly beneath the porch, and the horses were steaming. Gathered round the wagons were some of the men who had been drinking in the bar earlier in the evening, and there were strangers in the yard whom Mary had never seen before. She could see their faces clearly because of the moonlight. Meanwhile, the heavy dragging sound continued. Something was being taken along the passage to the room with the barred windows and the bolted door. The contents of one covered wagon were not carried into the inn, but were transferred to one of the open farm carts drawn up beside the drinking well across the yard. The remaining wagons were unloaded one by one, and the packages were either placed in the open carts and driven out of the yard or were borne by the men into the house. All was done in silence. Those men who had shouted and sung earlier that night were now sober and quiet, bent on the business in hand. Joss Merlin came out of the porch, the peddler at his side. Is that the lot? The landlord called softly, and the driver of the last wagon nodded. The men began to climb into the carts. They did not leave unrewarded, all carried burdens of a sort, boxes strapped over their shoulders, bundles under the arms. So the wagons and the carts departed from Jamaica, and there was no one left standing in the yard but one man Mary had not seen before, the landlord of Jamaica in himself, and the peddler. Then they turned and went back into the house. Mary came away from the window and sat down upon the bed. What she had witnessed here tonight was smuggling on a grand scale. There was no doubt that Jamaica Inn was ideally situated for this purpose, and her uncle must have bought it for that reason. But had he the necessary brain and subtlety to lead such an enterprise? Had he been making preparations for tonight's work during the past week? Had she seen only part of the game, and was there still more for her to learn? Mary swore to give herself courage and a certain bold pretense. I'll not show fear before Joss Merlin or any man, she said. She dressed hurriedly, and opening the door, she stood and listened for a moment, hearing nothing but the slow, choking tick of the clock in the hall. She crept down the passage and came to the stairs. She trod gently one hand resting on the banister and the other against the wall to lighten her weight. The hall was black as a pit, and she hesitated, gathering courage to continue. A sudden beam of light shone into the passage, and she heard voices. The door of the bar had swung open, but not enough to see the men who must be sitting on the benches against the farther wall. Suddenly a man's voice rang out, the voice of a stranger. No and no again, he said. I'll not be a party to it. I'll break with you now and put an end to our agreement. That's murder you'd have me do, Mr. Merlin. There's no other name for it. It's common murder. I'll face any man in a fair fight and take punishment if need be. But when it comes to the killing of innocent folk, 
and maybe women and children amongst them. That's going straight to hell, Joss Merlin, and you know it as well as I do. Mary heard the man rise to his feet. Not so fast, my friend, her uncle said. You're soaked in this business up to your neck and be damned to your blasted conscience. Harry, bolt the door over there and put the bar across it. Now look here, Mr. Lawyer Clark. You've made a fool of yourself tonight, but you're not going to make a fool of me. You'd like to walk out of the door, wouldn't you? And get on your horse and be away to Bodmin. Yes, and by nine in the morning you'd have every magistrate in the country at Jamaica Inn and a regiment of soldiers into the bargain. Do your devil's work if you must, the stranger muttered. I can't stop you, and I give you my word I'll not inform against you. But join you, I will not. There was a silence, and then Joss Merlin spoke again. Have a care, he said softly. I heard another man say that once, and five minutes later he was treading the air on the end. Mary felt her forehead go clammy with sweat, and her uncle's voice came from very far away. Leave me alone with him, Harry, he said. There'll be no more work for you tonight at Jamaica. Somehow Mary found her way to the hall, and hardly conscious of what she was doing, she turned the handle of the parlour door and stumbled inside. In a moment she heard the clatter of a pony's hooves in the yard outside, her uncle was alone now in the bar with his victim. She was about to step into the hall when a sound from above made her pause. It was the creaking of a board. Quiet footsteps were pacing gently overhead. Someone was in the empty guest room on the floor above. Mary's heart began to thump and her breath came quickly. Someone, an ally perhaps, was hiding in the guest room next to hers and could help her save the stranger in the bar. She had had her foot on the lower step of the stairs when she heard her uncle come out into the hall and climb the stairs to the landing above. His footsteps came to a halt outside the guest room and then he tapped twice, very softly, on the door. Someone crossed the floor and the door was opened. Mary's heart sank within her. This could be no enemy to her uncle. Now they were coming down the stairs. They stopped for an instant outside the parlour door. It's for you to say, her uncle whispered. It's your judgment now, not mine. I'll do it, or we'll do it between us. It's for you to say the word. Then the door closed, and she heard them no more. She must have stood for ten minutes or more waiting. Once she fancied she heard a cry, but it was gone and lost in an instant. At length she went out into the hall and through the passage to the door to the bar. Lifting the latch, she stepped into the room. There was nobody there. The door leading to the yard was open and the room was filled with the fresh November air. A last ray of moonlight made a white circle on the floor and into the circle moved a dark blob like a finger. Mary looked up to the ceiling and saw that a rope had been slung through a hook in the beam and it kept moving backwards and forwards, blown by the draught from the open door. Mary Yellen settled down to life at Jamaica Inn with a sense of stubborn resolution. She had not a doubt that the stranger had been killed by her uncle and another man, and his body buried somewhere on the moors. Two weeks went by and there was no repetition of Saturday night. Her uncle appeared to have no objection to her wandering on the moors, and though lonely, she was not actively unhappy. But the future looked very black at times, especially as Aunt Patience made little effort to be companionable. Any normal conversation was practically impossible, and Mary came to humour her and talk gently as she would have done to a child. 
One morning, Mary set herself to clean down the long stone passage that ran the full width of the back of the house. She was about to start on the stone flags of the entrance hall when she heard a clatter of hooves in the yard, and in a moment someone thundered on the closed door of the bar. Mary wiped her hands on her apron and went into the bar. A man was sitting straddle-legged across a chair with a glass in his hand filled to the brim with ale, which he had calmly poured out from the tap himself. For a few minutes they considered one another in silence. Something about him was familiar, and Mary wondered where she'd seen him before. What do you think you're doing? She said sharply. You haven't any right to walk in here and help yourself. Besides, the landlord doesn't encourage strangers. The man finished his ale and held out the glass to be refilled. Since when have they kept a barmaid at Jamaica Inn? He asked her, and feeling in his pocket for a pipe, he lit it, puffing a great cloud of smoke into her face. His manner infuriated Mary, and she leant forward and pulled the pipe out of his hand, throwing it behind her onto the floor. Is this how they train you to serve customers? He said. What have you been doing with yourself? Your hair is coming down at the back and your face is none too clean. Mary turned away and walked towards the door, but he called her back. Fill up my glass. That's what you're here for, isn't it? I'll tell Mr. Merlin you're in the bar and he can serve you himself, she said. The man laughed. <laughs> do you order Joss about in that way? He must be a changed man if you do. I never thought he'd run a young woman alongside his other activities. Mary flushed scarlet. Joss Merlin is my uncle by marriage. Aunt Patience was my mother's only sister. My name is Mary Yellen. She left the bar and walked into the kitchen, straight into the arms of the landlord. Who in hell's name were you talking to in the bar? I thought I'd warned you to keep your mouth shut. The loudness of his voice echoed in the passage. All right, called the man from the bar. Don't beat her. She's broken my pipe and refused to serve me. That sounds like your training, doesn't it? Joss Merlin frowned, and pushing Mary aside, he stepped into the bar. Oh, it's you, Jem, is it? He said. What do you want at Jamaica today? He closed the door, leaving Mary in the passage outside. She went back to the front hall, wiping the dirty mark from her face with her apron. So that was Jem Merlin, her uncle's younger brother. What a vile breed they were, these Merlins, with their studied insolence and coarseness, their rough brutality of manner. But there was a certain strength about Jem that the eldest brother did not possess. He looked hard and keen. Mary proceeded to sweep the gloomy, dim parlour that had not seen a broom for years. While absorbed in her disagreeable task, a shower of pebbles hit the glass, and looking out of the window, she saw Jem Merlin standing in the yard beside his pony. Mary went out into the porch. What do you want now? she asked him conscious suddenly of her loose hair and rumpled, dirty apron. He had the grace to appear the smallest bit ashamed of himself. Forgive me if I was rude to you just now. Somehow I didn't expect to see a woman at Jamaica Inn. Not a young girl like you, anyway. I thought Joss had found you in one of the towns and had brought you back here for his fancy lady. Mary flushed again and bit her lip in annoyance. There's nothing very fanciful about me, she said scornfully, turning to go back into the house. Come, don't go away. If you knew my brother as well as I do, you'd understand me making the mistake. Why did you come here in the first place? I came here to be with my aunt Patience, she said. My mother died some weeks ago, and I have no other relative. I'm thankful my mother isn't alive to see her sister now. It was the worst day in her life when she met your brother. Jem whistled tunelessly.
and patted his horse's neck. We Merlins have never been good to our women. Mary was silent. How long do you mean to stay in Jamaica? he asked abruptly. I'm not going away unless I take my aunt with me. I'd never leave her here alone, not after what I've seen. What have you learnt in your short time? he questioned. She shrugged her shoulders, dismissing the subject. I helped my uncle in the bar one Saturday night, and I did not think much of the company he kept. I don't suppose you did, said Jem. What do you do for a livelihood? asked Mary in sudden curiosity, for during their conversation she became aware that he spoke better than his brother. I'm a horse thief, he said pleasantly. Then he looked at her gravely. Look here, I'm serious now. Jamaica Inn is no place for a maid. There's no reason why you should be caught up in my brother's dirty schemes. Why don't you run away? I'd see you on the road to Bodmin, all right. I don't need any help, she said. I can look after myself. All right, Jem said. I won't worry you. My cottage is across the Withy Brook, if you ever want me. The other side of Truatha Marsh at the foot of twelve men's moor. Good day to you. Mary went slowly back into the house. She was in urgent need of a friend, but she could not make a friend of the landlord's brother. That night the wagons came again. Mary woke to the sound of the hall clock striking two, and almost at once she was aware of footsteps beneath the porch and she heard a voice speak soft and low. She crept out of bed and went over to the window. Yes, there they were. Only two carts this time with one horse in harness and less than half a dozen men standing in the yard. This time the wagons had arrived empty, and as soon as they were loaded with the remainder of the cargo deposited at the inn the time before, they rumbled out of the yard and turned left in the direction of Launston. The next few days passed without incident. Then came a fine, crisp morning with frost on the ground, and for once the sun shone in a cloudless sky. Mary sang as she worked. Her uncle had ridden away on the moors somewhere, and a sense of freedom possessed her whenever he was gone. An urgent tapping on the window made her look up, and she saw Aunt Patience beckon to her, very white in the face and evidently frightened. Mary ran to the back door, and her aunt seized her with trembling hands and began to blabber incoherently. Quietly, quietly, said Mary. I cannot understand what you're saying. Here, take this chair and sit down. Now, what is it? It's Mr. Bassett from North Hill, Aunt Patience whispered. I, I saw him from the parlour window. Even as she spoke, there was a loud knock at the entrance door. Why has he come? she cried. He's heard something. I know he has. Mary thought quickly. If this was Mr. Bassett and he represented the law, it was her one chance to tell him of the wagons and all she had seen since her arrival. Her aunt looked at her with haggard, desperate eyes. Mary, she said, I can trust you, can't I? You'll not tell him of the wagons. If any danger came to Joss, I'd kill myself, Mary. There was no argument after that. Mary would lie herself into hell rather than let her aunt suffer. You needn't be afraid of me, she said. I shall say nothing. Come, we must not keep Mr. Bassett waiting. Mary unbolted the heavy door. You take your time here, don't you? Mr. Bassett said. There doesn't seem to be much of a welcome for travellers. Is the landlord at home? Aunt Patience made him a little curtsy. If you please, Mr. Bassett, 
she said, speaking unnaturally loudly and clearly. My husband went out as soon as he had had his breakfast, and whether he will be back before nightfall I really cannot say. Hmm, growled the squire. That's a damned nuisance. I wanted a word or two with Mr. Joss Merlin. I won't stand for having my land hereabouts made a byword for everything that's damnable and dishonest. And Jamaica Inn stinks from here to the coast. Well, while I'm here, I may as well look round. I'm a magistrate, and I have a warrant. He pushed his way past the two women to the entrance hall. The rooms of the inn were thoroughly explored. The squire peered into the dusty corners and lifted the old sacks and prodded potatoes, uttering exclamations of anger and disgust. Call this an inn, do you? he said. Why, you haven't even a bed fit to sleep a cat. The place is rotten. Rotten right through. What's the idea, eh? Have you lost your tongue, Mrs. Merlin? What about you, young woman? Have you anything to say? It's only lately I've come to stay here, replied Mary. My mother died, and I'm here to look after my aunt. She's not very strong. Well, now you'll kindly show me the room that has barred windows. I noticed it from the yard, and I'd like to see inside. I'm very sorry, sir, Mary replied, but I'm afraid the door is locked. My uncle always keeps the key. The squire snorted and went out into the yard. He returned with his man, Richards, who carried an old bar he had found in the stable. It was with some excitement that Mary watched them ram it against the lock of the door. There was a splitting of wood and a crash, and the door gave way. For a moment there was silence. Then the squire turned, clicking his tongue in annoyance. Nothing, he said. Absolutely nothing. Except for a pile of sacks in one corner, the room was completely empty, and it was thick with dust and cobwebs. On the top of the sacks lay a length of twisted rope. The squire shrugged his shoulders. Well, Mr. Joss Merlin has won this time, he said. There's not enough evidence in that room to kill a cat. He pointed his crop at Mary. Your aunt may have lost her tongue, but do you mean to tell me you know nothing of your uncle's business? Does nobody ever call here by day or by night? Mary looked him straight in the eyes. I've never seen anyone, she said. Have you ever looked into that barred room before today? No, never in my life. Have you ever heard wheels in the yard by night? I'm a very heavy sleeper. Nothing ever wakes me. Don't you think it's very peculiar to keep an inn on the King's Highway and then bolt and bar your house to every passerby? My uncle is a very peculiar man. He's so damned peculiar that half the people in the countryside won't sleep easy in their beds until he's been hanged. You can tell him that from me. I will, Mr. Bassett. One other thing. Have you seen anything of your uncle's younger brother, Jem Merlin of Truitha? No, said Mary steadily. He never comes here. Well, that's all I want from you this morning. Good day to you both. Joss Merlin returned just before noon, and he was met at once with a babble of words from his wife. In a little while, he beckoned Mary from the window. Come on, he shouted. What's your side of the story? What in hell's been going on here? Mary told him calmly what had taken place and ended with Mr. Bassett's own words that people would not sleep easy in their beds until Joss Merlin was hanged. The damned skulking bastard! He'd no right to walk into my house. His talk of a magistrate's warrant was all bluff. Damn and blast his eyes! I'll teach Mr. Bassett who's got the run of this country. But for all his thunder, he was frightened. Mary could see that, and his confidence was rudely shaken. 
get me something to eat, he said. I must go out again, and there's no time to lose. As soon as he had finished, the landlord rose to his feet, and Mary watched him climb the stile and strike across the moor. For a moment, she debated the wisdom of the sudden plan in her head, and then she ran down the field after her uncle. Perhaps by following him she could learn something of his secret mission. She had no doubt that the squire's visit to Jamaica had altered the landlord's plans, and that this sudden departure on foot across the heart of the West Moor was connected with it. Her task was a difficult one. The landlord walked at such a pace that before long Mary saw she would be left behind. She paused to wipe her streaming face and then plunged on in trail of her uncle. She could just make out his figure amongst the black heather and the great boulders at the foot of Brown Willie. Then he was hidden by a jutting crag of granite, and she saw him no more. It was impossible to discover the path he had taken, and discouraged and depressed, Mary scrambled down the steep face of the tor to the plain below. By now mist and darkness had settled on the moors, and all sense of direction was lost to her. Whatever happened, she must keep her head and not give way to her growing sense of panic. Mary walked steadily ahead, feeling the ground with some care, and at length she came to a rough track which broadened and was crossed in turn by another running left and right. She stood uncertainly for a few moments, wondering which to take. It was then that she heard the sound of a horse. His hooves made a dull, thudding sound on the turf. Out of the mist, a horse and rider appeared. The horseman pulled up when he saw Mary. Hello, he cried. Who's there? Is anyone in trouble? Mary seized hold of his rein. Can you put me on the road, she said. I'm miles from home and hopelessly lost. Where have you come from, he asked. Of course I will help you if I can. His voice was low and gentle, and Mary could see he must be a person of quality. I live at Jamaica Inn, she said. For a moment, the man was silent. Jamaica Inn, you've come a long way out of your road, I'm afraid. He considered her for a moment. You're exhausted, he said. You aren't fit to walk another step. We are not far from the village, and you shall come home with me and rest a while and have some supper before I take you back to Jamaica Inn. He spoke with such solicitude and yet with such calm authority that Mary sighed with relief, content to trust herself to his keeping. Looking up at him, she saw his eyes for the first time. They were strange eyes, transparent like glass, and so pale in color that they seemed near to white. His hair was white, too, under his black shovel hat, and Mary stared at him in some perplexity, for his face was unlined, and his voice was not that of an elderly man. Then, with a little rush of embarrassment, she understood. He was an albino. Perhaps I had better introduce myself, he said with a smile. My name is Francis Davy, and I am the vicar of Altenham. Mary spread her hands to the log fire and watched the man as he laid the table for supper. It was a novelty to be waited upon. Hannah lives in the village, he said. She leaves every afternoon at four. I prefer to be by myself. I like getting my own supper, and then I can choose my own time. He poured her out a steaming cup of tea. It was providential that I should come upon you on the moor tonight. My work sometimes takes me to the outlying cottages and farms. Why were you wandering there tonight? Mary hesitated, turning the words over in her mind. Come, he said with a smile. I have heard confession in my time. Your story will not sound as strange to me as you think. There are other worlds besides Jamaica Inn. She felt humbled and confused, and plunged headlong into her story with jerky, ill-framed sentences. 
Her tale sounded flat and unconvincing, even to herself who knew the truth of it. He heard her to the end with patience, but all the while she felt his white eyes watching her, and he had a little trick of swallowing at intervals. The fear she had sustained, the agony and the doubt, sounded to her ears like the worked-up invention of an overstimulated mind. When she had finished, the vicar got up from his chair and began to pace around the room. Then he came to a standstill on the hearth with his back to the fire and looked down upon Mary. I believe you, of course, he said after a moment or so. You haven't the face of a liar, and I doubt if you know the meaning of hysteria. But your story wouldn't go in a court of law, not as you've told it tonight, anyhow. I can tell you one thing, though. The squire's visit will have scared your uncle. There won't be any more wagons to Jamaica in for some while. I think you can be sure of that. What about the stranger who disappeared? said Mary. He was murdered, I am certain of that. Forgive me, but I think you allowed your imagination to run away with you over that. All you saw was a piece of rope, remember? I heard my uncle threaten him, persisted Mary. My dear child, people threaten one another every day in the year, but they don't hang for it. Now, I'm going to drive you back to Jamaica Inn. The night was fine. The dark clouds of the early evening had passed away, and the sky was ablaze with stars. Francis Davy drove a big grey cob who, fresh from his sojourn in the stable, went like the wind. It was a strange, exhilarating drive. And it did not seem long before Mary could see the tall chimneys of Jamaica Inn outlined against the sky. The vicar stopped the horse just short of the yard, under the lee of the grass bank. There's a light in the kitchen, Mary whispered. That means my uncle is there. Her companion motioned to her to be still. I am going to look in at the window. She watched him gazing into the kitchen. Then he beckoned to her to follow. There'll be no argument tonight with the landlord of Jamaica Inn, she said. Joss Merlin was sprawled at the table in a drunken stupor. He stared before him at the guttering candle, his eyes glazed and fixed like a dead man. You can walk inside and go upstairs to bed, Francis Davy said. Your uncle will not see you. Good night to you, Mary Ellen. If you are ever in trouble and need me, I shall be waiting for you at Altonham. Joss Merlin was drunk for five days. He was insensible most of the time and lay stretched out on a bed in the kitchen that Mary and her aunt had improvised between them. The weather was cold and grey, but on the fifth morning the wind dropped and the sun shone, and Mary slipped out of the house and crossed the high road to the moors. This time she made for the east moor, striking out towards Kilmar. She had walked for an hour or more before her further progress was barred by a stream. She forded it and followed its course along the winding valley between the hills. A solitary curlew rose into the air calling its plaintive note. Something had disturbed him. A handful of ponies clattered down the hill and splashed into the stream to drink. They must have come through a gate on the left that led to a rough farm track heavy with mud. Mary leant against the gate and watched the ponies, and out of the tail of her eye she saw a man coming down the track. It was Jem Merlin. She stood where she was until he came to her. So you've found your way to me, have you? He grinned. I didn't expect you so soon. Mary could not help smiling. I didn't even know you lived here, she said. I don't believe you. Well, you've come in good time to cook my dinner. Mary looked him up and down. Do you always make use of folk this way? I don't often have the chance, he told her. But you may as well stop now you're here. I've done all my own cooking since my mother died. Come in. 
The room was small and square and littered with rubbish. Mary looked about her in dismay. Don't you ever do any cleaning? She asked him. You've got this kitchen like a pigsty. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Leave me a bucket of water and find me a broom. I'll not eat my dinner in a place like this. In half an hour she had the kitchen scrubbed clean as a pin and all the rubbish cleared away. Meanwhile, some mutton boiled in a saucepan on the fire, surrounded by potato and turnip. The smell was good, and Jem came in at the door, sniffing the air like a hungry dog. I shall have to keep a woman, he said. I can see that. Will you leave your aunt and come and look after me? You'd have to pay me too much, said Mary. How long has your mother been dead? Seven years this Christmas. What with my father hanged and Matt drowned and Joss gone off to America, I cleared off. But I came back here to have my Christmas dinner and found the place deserted and the door locked up. They told me my mother had died. She'd been buried three weeks. I was mad. I might just as well have stayed away for all the dinner I got that Christmas. It will be a good thing when there's not a Merlin left in Cornwall, Mary said. You and your brother were born twisted and evil. Do you never think of what your mother must have suffered? Jem looked at her in surprise. Mother was all right, he said. She never complained. She was used to us. Mary got up and began to clear away the plates in silence. How's the landlord of Jamaica Inn? said Jem. Drunk, said Mary shortly. That'll be the ruin of Joss. How long has it lasted this time? Five days. Oh, that's nothing to Joss. But when the drink has soaked into him, you want to watch him. He's dangerous then. You look out for yourself. He'll not touch me. I'll take good care of that said Mary. He's got other things to worry him. Has anything been happening at Jamaica? We had Mr. Bassett from North Hill last week, said Mary. Jem brought his chair to the ground with a crash. The devil you did, he said. And what had the squire to say to you? Uncle Joss was from home, said Mary, and Mr. Bassett insisted on coming into the inn and going through the rooms. He broke down the door at the end of the passage, but the room was empty. He seemed disappointed and very surprised. He asked after you, as it happened, and I told him I'd never set eyes on you. Jem whistled tunelessly, his expression blank as Mary told her tale. But when she came to the mention of his name, his eyes narrowed. Why did you lie to him? he asked. It seemed less trouble at the time. You've got nothing to hide, have you? Nothing much except that black pony you saw by the brook belongs to him, said Jem carelessly. He was dapple grey last week and worth a small fortune to the squire who bred him himself. He'll go to Launceston on Christmas Eve. The dealers there will swallow him up. They went out into the sun. Jem broke off a piece of grass and began to chew it glancing sideways at his companion. What did Squire Bassett expect to see at Jamaica Inn? Mary looked him straight in the eyes. You ought to know that better than I do. How much do you know? Mary shrugged her shoulders. It was lucky for Joss the stuff had been shifted. I told him last week he was sailing too close to the wind. It's only a matter of time before they catch him. Mary said nothing. You must have a good view from that little room over the porch. How do you know that's my room? Mary asked swiftly. He looked taken aback at her question. She saw the surprise flash through his eyes. The window was wide open when I rode into the yard the other morning. I've never seen a window open at Jamaica Inn before. What are you trying to make me tell you? And what does it matter to you how much I know? Your brother can drink himself to death for all I care. 
His life is his own, and so is his business. It's nothing to do with me. Jem whistled and kicked at a loose stone with his foot. So smuggling doesn't appall you after all. But supposing he meddled in other things, supposing it was a question of life and death and perhaps murder, what then? His careless, laughing manner was gone, and his eyes were grave, but she could not read what lay behind them. I don't know what you mean, said Mary. He looked at her for a long time without speaking. Perhaps not, he said at length, but you'll come to know if you stay long enough. Why does your aunt look like a living ghost? Ask her next time the wind blows from the northwest. With that, he turned on his heel and went off onto the moor. Mary watched him thoughtfully. So her first instinct had been right. And there was something behind the smuggling after all. The stranger in the bar that night had talked of murder, and now Jem himself had echoed his words. Could it have been Jem who had hidden in the empty guest room that Saturday night? Something went cold inside her. The conversation had cast a shadow on her day. She wanted to be off now, and she began to walk slowly down the hill. She had reached the gate at the bottom of the track when she heard his running footsteps behind her. Why are you going? he said. It's early. What's the matter with you? He took her chin in his hands and looked into her face. I believe you're frightened of me. She smiled back at him in spite of herself. I'm not afraid of you. I'd even like you, if you didn't remind me so much of your brother. I'm much better looking than Josh. You must allow me that. Are you coming to Launceston with me on Christmas Eve? Say you're coming, Mary. What will you be doing at Launceston, Jem Merlin? Only selling Mr. Bassett's pony for him, my dear. Supposing you're caught. No one's going to catch me. Not yet a while, anyway. Take a risk, Mary. Don't you like excitement? They must rid you soft down Helford Way. She rose like a fish to his bait. All right, then, Jem Merlin. You needn't think I'm afraid. How do we go to Launceston? I'll take you there in the jingle, with Mr. Bassett's pony behind us. Mary said goodbye and walked away up the hill without a backward glance or a wave of her hand. Darkness was falling as she crossed the high road and into the yard. She went round to the back of the house and tapped on the door of the kitchen. It was opened immediately by her aunt, who seemed pale and anxious. Your uncle has been asking for you all day, she said. Where have you been? It's nearly five o'clock. I was walking on the moors, replied Mary. I didn't think it mattered. Why should Uncle Joss ask for me? Aunt Patience blinked and worked her mouth. It's only his fancy, she said. You mustn't pay any attention to what he says at times like these. I'll go and tell him you're home. Mary crossed to the dresser and poured herself a glass of water from the pitcher. Her throat was very dry. The glass trembled in her hands, and she cursed herself for a fool. Aunt Patience came back into the room. He's quiet for the moment, she whispered. He's dozed off in the chair. He may sleep now for the evening. The long evening passed. Her aunt put her work away. I'm going to bed. Your uncle won't wait now. He must have settled for the night. I shan't disturb him. Mary murmured something in reply and soon felt the lethargy of sleep steal upon her. When she awoke, the fire was out, and on lifting her eyes, she saw the door of the kitchen opening very slowly, an inch at a time. She sat without moving, and suddenly the door was flung wide. Joss Merlin stood on the threshold, his arms outstretched, rocking on his two feet. Who's there? He said. What are you doing? Why don't you speak? 
Uncle Joss, Mary said softly. Uncle Joss. Mary, he said. Is it, is it you, Mary? Where have they gone? Have you seen them? You've made a mistake, Uncle Joss, she said. Th there's no one here, only myself. He looked about him, searching the corners of the room. They can't scare me. Dead men don't harm the living. They're blotted out. Like a candle. That's it, isn't it, Mary? She nodded, watching his eyes. He pulled himself to a chair and sat down. I'm thirsty, Mary. Here's the key. Go into the bar and fetch me some brandy. When she returned, she put the bottle and a glass on the table in front of him. He filled the glass half full and held it between his two hands. They, they pay gold for this up country. The best that money can buy. And what do I pay? Not one damn bloody sixpence. We drink free at Jamaica Inn. He laughed. <laughs> it's a hard game, Mary, but it's a man's game. They can't catch me, Mary. I'm too cunning. My God, I've seen blood in my time, Mary. I've killed men with my own hands. There was a woman once. Mary. She was clinging to a raft, and she had a child in her arms. The ship was close on the rocks, you see, and the sea was as flat as your hand. They were all coming in, alive. She cried out to me to help her, Mary, and I smashed her face in with a stone. We had to pelt at them all with stones. We had to break their arms and legs. And they drowned there in front of us. His face was close to Mary, his red flecked eyes staring into hers and his breath on her cheek. Did you never hear of wreckers before? On Christmas Eve, the sky was overcast and threatened rain. Mary leant out of the window. She had grown older in four days, and the face that looked back at her in the spotted, cracked mirror was drawn and tired. For the first time, she saw a resemblance between herself and her Aunt Patience, and at last Mary was able to understand the pale, twitching face, the hands that plucked at the dress, the wide, staring eyes. At first she had felt sick, deadly sick. Now that it was the third day and the first horror had passed, Mary felt indifferent, rather old, and very tired. Jem Merlin kept breaking into her thoughts against her will, and she did not want him. He lacked tenderness, he was rude. He had more than a streak of cruelty in him. He was a thief and a liar. He stood for everything she feared and hated and despised. But she knew she could love him. Something inside her responded to him. Once more she looked up at the grey sky and the low flying clouds. If she were going to Launceston with Jem, then it was time to make ready and be away. This was a strange Christmas tide. She pondered as she walked to meet him. Last year she had knelt beside her mother in church and had prayed for peace of mind and security. She was alone now, caught in a mesh of brutality and crime, living beneath a roof she loathed amongst people she despised, and she was walking out across a barren, friendless moor to meet a horse thief and a murderer of men. She would offer no prayers to God this Christmas. In the distance, Mary saw a little cavalcade approach her, the pony, the jingle, and two horses tethered behind. The driver raised his whip in a signal of welcome. She climbed into the cart beside him, and he looked at her curiously. 
What's the matter with you today? Your color is gone, and you've no light in your eyes. Are you feeling sick? I've not been out of the house since I last saw you, she said. I stayed up in my room with my thoughts. They didn't make cheerful company. I'm a deal older than I was four days ago. They jogged along in silence, Jem playing with a thong of the whip. Are you going to tell me why you've sat in your room for four days without speaking? Or do you want me to guess? You asked me last time we met if I knew why my aunt looked like a living ghost. Well, I know now, that's all. Jem watched her with curious eyes. What are you going to do about it? Mary shrugged her shoulders. I haven't made up my mind. I have to consider Aunt Patience. You don't expect me to tell you, do you? There are many gaps in the story, and you fit remarkably well into some of them. So you think I wreck ships, do you? And stand on the shore and watch men drown, and then put my hands into their pockets afterwards when they're swollen with water. It makes a pretty picture. If you believe it of me, why do you drive with me today to Launceston? She steeled herself to gaiety. For the sake of your bright eyes, Jem Merlin. I ride with you for no other reason. He laughed at that, and all at once there was ease between them. It was a hilarious and rather heated cavalcade that clattered into Launceston at half past two in the afternoon. Away from the shadow of Jamaica Inn, Mary's natural youth and spirits returned. They stabled the pony and jingle at the top of the town, and Jem pushed his way through the crowd, leading his two stolen horses, Mary following at his heels. There was a place roped off from the fair for the buying and selling of livestock, and Jem took his place amongst a group of men with ponies, and nodded to one or two of them. The black pony was looked at somewhat askance by the dealers, but at a quarter to four, Jem sold the other horse for six pounds to a cheerful, honest-looking farmer. Twilight gathered in the market square, and the lamps were lit, and Mary was thinking of returning to the jingle when she heard a woman's voice behind her. Oh, look, James, she was saying. See that delicious pony. He holds his head just like poor Beauty did. The likeness would be quite striking. Only this animal is black. Ask the price, James, will you? The man struck it forward. Here, my good fellow, he called to Jem. What is the price for that black pony of yours? Twenty-five guineas, Jem said promptly. The lady swept into the ring. I'm Mrs. Bassett from North Hill, and I want the pony as a Christmas present for my children, and as a surprise for Mr. Bassett, whose thoroughbred pony was stolen recently. My groom shall fetch it immediately. Here's the money. Jem swept off his hat and bowed low. Thank you, madam, he said. I hope Mr. Bassett will be pleased with your bargain. You will find the pony exceedingly safe with children. The lady made her way from the ring towards the coach that waited in the square. Jem looked hastily over his shoulder and tapped a lad who stood behind him. Here, he said. Would you like a five-shilling piece? The lad nodded, his mouth agape. Hang on to this pony, then, and when the groom comes for him, hand him over for me, will you? And he was off in a moment, walking hard across the square. Mary followed, a discreet ten paces behind. She was near to collapsing with laughter when they reached the farther side of the square, out of sight of the coach. Jem Merlin, you deserve to be hanged, she said, when she'd recovered herself. To stand there as you did in the market square and sell that stolen pony back to Mrs. Bassett herself? You have the cheek of the devil. Jem caught at her hand and crumpled the fingers. You're glad you came now, aren't you? Yes, she said recklessly, and she did not mind. They plunged into the thick of the fair with all the warmth and the suggestion of packed humanity about them. They sucked oranges and had their fortunes told. The wind rose in gusts. The rain fell. 
and people ran hither and thither for shelter. Jem dragged Mary under cover of a doorway, his arms around her shoulders, and he turned her face against him and held her with his hands and kissed her. She felt the tips of his fingers on her neck traveling to her shoulders, and she put up her hands and pushed them away. It's time we thought of returning, she said. Let me alone. Go and fetch the pony, Jem, while the shower lifts for the moment. I'll wait for you here. Don't be a Puritan, Mary. Stay here with me tonight. I'd rather risk a soaking in the jingle. God, you're hard as flint, Mary Ellen. All right, I'll fetch the jingle and take you home to your aunt. But I'll kiss you first, whether you like it or not. He took her face in his hands, one for sorrow, two for joy. I'll give you the rest when you're in a more yielding frame of mind. I'll not be long. Mary leant back once more within the shelter of the door and waited, stamping her feet and blowing upon her hands. The long minutes passed and Jem did not come. Somewhere a clock struck eight. He had been gone over half an hour. At last she could stand it no longer, and she set off up the hill in search of him. At the stable where they had left the pony and Jingle in the afternoon, the fellow who had admitted them to the shed earlier in the day told her Jem had been gone twenty minutes or more. He seemed in a great hurry, and there was another man with him. He looked like one of the servants from the White Hart. At the White Hart there was no sign of the pony and Jingle, and Mary's heart sank. Had the worst happened and the theft of the pony been discovered? There was no other explanation. Jem had gone. For the moment she was stunned, and hardly knowing what she did, she went away down the road, driven like a leaf before the wind, and out of the darkness she saw a carriage crawling up the hill towards her. She ran towards it and called to the driver, Are you taking the Bodmin Road? The driver shook his head and whipped on his horse, but before Mary could step aside, an arm came out of the carriage window and a hand was laid on her shoulder. What does Mary Ellen do alone in Launceston on Christmas Eve? said a voice from within. It was the vicar of Altonan. So once more I have the good fortune to help you by the wayside. He stared at her with cold indifference and she found herself stumbling into an explanation of her day that made her sound like an ignorant country girl who had cheapened herself at Launceston Fair and had been left by the man of her choice to find her way home alone. What was the name of your companion? He asked quietly. He was my uncle's brother, she replied, the admission dragging from her like a confession. He is dishonest and a thief. I know that. Her words tailed off. You mean the brother knows nothing of the landlord's trade by night? Said the gentle voice at her side. He is not of the company who bring the wagons to Jamaica Inn. Mary made a little gesture of despair. I don't know. I have no proof. But he said that my uncle was running straight into the hands of the law and they would catch him before long. He surely would not say that if he was one of the company. Jem's innocence became suddenly of vital importance. You appear anxious for his safety, Francis Davy said. And if your new friend was guilty of conspiring with his brother against his fellow men, what then, Mary Yellen? Would you still seek to save him? Because she was both frightened and frustrated, she broke down. I didn't bargain for this, she said fiercely. I go round and round in a trap all because of a man I despise. I don't want to love like a woman, Mr. Davy. There's pain that way. I don't want it. Mary heard him swallow. You are very young, Mary Ellen. You will forget your friend with his stolen pony very soon. Then, following some train of thought, he said, so I was right in my surmise. 
And all has been quiet at Jamaica Inn since I last saw you. 